I'm starting a new life, turn wrongs into right. This is the Being Beloved Podcast. Reintegration, coming home, returning citizens, or reentry are just some of the terms used to describe the process of those who have been released from prison or jail and now must do the work of navigating and reestablishing themselves back into the communities from which they came. And for some, it's about relocating all together and starting anew. At Ark Republic, we wanted to take an intimate and honest look into some of the millions of formerly incarcerated who experience reentry, and in particular, that of women and women in Philadelphia. This is the birth of the Being Beloved podcast. Hey, yo, is this thing on? All right, good, 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 good. Here we go. Before we get to delve into the lives of those resilient women, we wanted to explore re-entry and the Philadelphia landscape. To do so, we turned the microphone around to first speak with the podcast's host, Dr. Rolanda Spencer. Dr. Spencer is the author of Reexamining Reentry and the executive director of the Alternative Education Research Institute. I got into reentry in about 2002. That's a, that's a convoluted story, but um, the short answer is uh, when I began working with youth in Chicago, I was teaching in uh, e-business program through DePaul University with a youth center there. And many of the population that I worked with, they were trying to get jobs and couldn't. And they couldn't because they had backgrounds. Although this was like an alternative education program, the students were adults. And many of them hadn't graduated from high school and did had different type of barriers that led them to incarceration. So I really wanted to develop a program that looked at their needs. From going from corporate to community work, I didn't realize the um, issues that a lot of the students were facing in my class. So it was almost like what I really need to be teaching them is how to get jobs with a background rather than trying to get a job in general because the situation didn't fit their circumstances. Dr. Spencer, for those who may not know, can you define what reentry is? Uh, reentry is the basically the transition from incarceration back into the community. It's called reentry in particular because most people, once they're inside, especially if they're inside over five years, they have to reacclimate and reenter their community in a different way. So prisoner reentry is really just the transition from incarceration back into the community. Dr. Spencer, colonial America, and even in the formation of the United States, all the way till today, there's always been some form of prison system in this society. So what made this idea or who brought this idea that reentry or reintegrating back into society should be part of the American phenomenon? Based on my research, this thing that we consider reentry the or the reentry process began really in the late 70s, early 80s when we started seeing more diversion programs. So the diversion programs were meant to be preemptive for high-risk youth and um, populations and things like that. However, what we were finding in the late 80s is that people were coming home and they didn't have a job. They didn't have anything, you know, and a lot of times they didn't have housing. So th there became a big push for reentry, initially, it was only for job training, okay? Because in the 80s, uh, you could go to college while you were in prison. But in 1994, with the omnibus crime bill, they stopped inmates from getting college educations while they were in prison. This was something that they was all they were always able to do. So many times, like if the 60s, 70s, 
early 80s, if they're coming home from prison, they might have a degree, they might have a certificate. You didn't necessarily have to disclose that you were in prison or incarcerated. They didn't have the check the box situation going on then. So 1994 is a, pr a pivotal point. When they pushed this crime bill, they took away all of those incentive programs while they were in prison. Even though you can still go to school and do some type of vocational work, the degrees you can't get the degrees anymore. So when you come out of prison, you have to do two things. You have to get housing, you have to have a job. So when they took away the education part, that's when they added the box where you had to disclose that you were a prisoner or a, a formerly incarcerated person. What Dr. Spencer is detailing is what happened in the 1990s during the Bush and Clinton presidencies that pushed out a slew of legislation that made it impossible for those to have a second chance in life. People are coming out. They're not able to find housing. They're not able to find jobs because they don't have any education. Now we have a problem. Now we have a situation where we can't we don't have anything to do with these ex-offenders. This is where you see the rise of the uh, transition house. So the thought of the transition house is that that six month period where you're transitioning out of prison, going back into society, that you're supposed to have a place where it covers your housing, but you get some type of training and you have six months to get all of that together. So that's the first time we see sort of like re-entry programs. They call them halfway houses on the streets and everything, but they're transitional houses. During the 1990s, the height of the crack era compounded by the Violent Crime Control and Law Enforcement Act of 1994 and Bill Clinton's welfare reform to change America of 1996 proved to be detrimental for both black and brown communities. As a result, incarceration shot up thus fueling the question, what will America do for those returning home? Now we're calling that the prison uh, re-entry complex. <laughs> that's, a, that's the term. <laughs> so it's, it's sort of like it became this, the impact really was a community impact. This is where you start seeing community organizations getting money from the government to really handle its own problems. Many people see it as a as you know a helping hand to the community. I see it a little different. It's let's throw some money at this problem in the communities. Let the community organizations handle it. You know, we'll give them some money. We'll take it away from them after two or three years. It doesn't have to be research based. A lot of times they're run by um, ex offenders themselves, so they miss a crucial piece of their own project or their own projects or process. Okay. So the implications were throw money at the problem and it didn't work. It doesn't work. In my opinion, to a large degree, it doesn't work. Dr. Spencer, from the work that you've done, what do you consider a successful or a healthy and effective re-entry process or experience? My research suggests that there needs to be sort of a a transition period within the transition itself, right? So we have to look at and deal with the socio-emotional trauma that was dealt with or that had happened in prison that was not dealt with upon release. So you have the institutionalization, you have the various mental health issues. If they have substance abuse issues, you have all of these compounding things that are not addressed when you simply take a person out, put them in a halfway house, make them get a job and make them move on. So what we're not dealing with is the new person that they have become. So I think that in my research, what I'm looking at is how in re-entry, we work with the person that they are at the time of release, not who they we hope they are when they get a job that gives them a living wage or who they were before they even went in. You know, if you go in for five years and you're in a cage, essentially, right? You can't make decisions for yourself. You're in this constant struggle and survival mode. When you come home, it changes you. 
on top of that, if you've been in for more than five years, when you come home, things are substantially different than when you left. There's this thought that once a person goes in for goes into prison at a certain age, so let's just say they go in at 18 and they come out when they're 30. 35. When they come home, they're still functioning as that 18-year-old. You don't grow up in prison. It's a manufactured environment. So you don't have organic experiences that you would in the world, right? You have these experiences that are based on this experiment called prison. And they're very, not just traumatic, but dangerous to the psyche. I am loving this conversation, Dr. Spencer. Now, can you explain, we're going to do a little shift here and we're going to go into the part that talks about gender. Can you explain why women have been left largely out of the discussion of what reentry looks like and also formulating and reconfiguring reentry programs? For me, the reason why women are left out of the conversation is because much of the time the conversations are had by men. Plain and simple, you know, there's not a lot of women in the re-entry space. And when we do have, and I'm talking about practitioners, right? Um, we don't have a whole lot of women practitioners. And even when there are women practitioners, um, women practitioners, males dominate the field. So when they're looking at building prisoner re-entry programs, even if they build them for women, they're really based on the needs of men. Again, we go back to the standard jobs, housing. You might be able to get some type of substance abuse or counseling and things like that. But what about um, mental health that is um, necessary for women specifically? What, what about physical health care? For women specifically, what about mothers who still have who are or who are seeking to get custody from their uh, of their children and find housing and find a job? So women's issues are just innately different. But when you have men, just like with the abortion issue, when you have men making decisions about women's health and well-being, usually they get it wrong. So along those lines where uh, these male-centered programs cannot identify nor create programs that meet the specific needs of women. Can you talk about women going through reintegration and also navigating these ideas around gender norms or gender expe expectations and ideas around womanhood and womanness? In terms of how women negotiate femininity, is a is a big issue, right? So women, and I'm throwing up the quotes, women are not prisoners, right? They're not criminals. They don't do crimes. Unless you look at African American women or black women, when black women are kind of expected to be hard and aggressive, you know, this whole ride or die thing that we celebrate or did celebrate in the black community for a long time. I think with Black women, the issues are different altogether because where I think a lot of times Black women are trying to hold on to their femininity, they can't. So they enter into these spaces, they become hard. And then when they come out, there's these feelings of guilt, especially if they have a family to take care of, right? If they have children, they disappointed them. It's different for dad to be gone for years and mom to be gone for years. We don't expect mom to ever leave, no matter what the situation is. So that woman, when she comes home, has a whole different type of issue to deal with than any man, right? Just because of the expectations of women. And Black women are expected to take care of their households. If they can't do it alone, where the expectation is for them to be alone, then they're falling short, right? Even just in terms of just having a, ho a home. They're expected to maintain things that other women, it's like they're expected to have somebody to help. Black women don't have that. That's a unique struggle for Black women. Dr. Spencer, what makes Philadelphia a very interesting site to study women in reentry? Uh, Philly is an interesting place to start this conversation, mainly because almost half of Philly's 
female returning citizens go back to prison within 18 months. And, you know, it's not the highest in the country, but it's high for a major city. When you have a city that is as big and as old as Philadelphia, you know, we would we would want to think that they had a better handle on the transition than this. Philly only has three re-entry programs for women in particular, but they have many re-entry programs altogether. You know what I'm saying? So where there might be three for women, there may be a hundred in the city alone for men. So why is it in Philly that the women are going back so quickly? So not so quickly, but at all at that rate. So Philly being a major city on the East Coast with a prominent, uh, you know, re-entry population, I think, I think it starts here. So I think this is just an inter interesting time with the rise of women practitioners, some of the ones that we've talked to and others who are really now looking at, well, how can we help? This is an excellent segue of asking you, why do you see a need based on everything you said thus far for a podcast such as Being Beloved? Oh, well, the Being Beloved podcast is important right now because, again, we are usually seeing prisoner re-entry through this male lens and male gaze. So it's, when you look at men in re-entry, there's, mm, let me, I want to say this correctly. When you see them in videos, when you hear them on podcasts, there's almost this bravado, I think, that goes with it. You know what I mean? Like, oh yeah, I survived and I'm this now and I'm that now and I'm a counselor and I do re-entry or what have you. But when you talk to women, there's some guilt, there's some shame in their story. So being beloved brings the humanity back to the women. What I liked is that we had different women that talked about different things. There were some issues where women had with housing, right? Some had with love relationships. Some had with just trusting themselves, right? So it's like you get to see all of these different facets of womanhood, womanness, through the through the eyes of someone who experienced this in trauma, this trauma of incarceration. And we don't get to see that. And being beloved shows women in their softness, not just their criminality. And I think that's important as well. Thank you so much for this time. Now wrapping this up, Dr. Spencer, for those who are listening, who are currently going through reintegration or are about to be released and start the process, what do you want them to take away from this podcast series, as well as those audience members who are listening, who may have folk, family, and friends that are, are experiencing it too, or just want to know more about how they can be part of the solution. I would, I would like for them to take away that they're not alone in their struggle or their journey. We had, what, six women at this point um, that we talked to, and they were so familiar. The stories were so similar. And let's just take away that the fact that they went to prison. Many of us have gone through those same things and haven't gone to prison. You see what I'm saying? So these are just women who went through what they went through, but their humanity wasn't lost because they got caught up. Because oftentimes that's what it was. They got caught up, they got overwhelmed, they got into a situation, and I think we have all been there. And lastly, what can you say to the practitioners, the researchers, even the journalists who are listening and are covering women in reentry? So what I want researchers and practitioners to get from the Being Beloved podcast is I want them to see that there, uh, there is a gap that needs to be filled. But more than that, there is a gap that needs to be filled by women practitioners. Some of these issues and some of these things men can't, they can't navigate. They just can't, but we can as women. So we have to be able as researchers, as practitioners to not be afraid to go into that space, to learn what's going on with the women beyond the books, right? The practitioners are there 
and they're, you know, they're in the mix. But the researchers, a lot of times, are just going by what they read. You have to go into those spaces. You have to go into those communities. You have to go into those prisons. You have to go into those reentry programs. You have to talk to these women. And then you can paint a picture. But Black women have to get more involved in this in this discussion and in this work. I'm starting a new life. I don't know about you, but this conversation just blew my mind. I would like to thank Dr. Rolanda Spencer for setting it off and establishing such an excellent space to talk about women who are going through reentry in Arc Republic's brand new Being Beloved podcast series. We would like to thank the Valentine Foundation for providing a grant to make this podcast series happen. As well, a huge shout out to Linfest Journalism Institute, where the Being Beloved podcast was developed. Tracy Powell of the Pivot Fund, who gave us the little nugget to cover reentry, and our sister sister organization, Love Now Media, who fiercely supports Arc Republic and anything that has to do with love. Until next time, be beloved, beloveds. I am Dr. Kaya Niambi Shivers. I'm starting a new life. Turn wrongs into right. This is the being beloved.